The committee will come to order. The chair notes a presence of the uh, of a quorum. The Committee on Natural Resources is meeting today to hear testimony on the impact of the administration's wild lands order on jobs and economic growth. Under Committee Rule 4F, opening statements are limited to the chairman and ranking member of the uh, committee so we can hear from our witnesses more quickly. However, I do ask unanimous consent uh, to include, include any other members' opening statements in the hearing recorded if submitted to the clerk by close of business today. Without objection, so ordered. Last year, just two days before Christmas, Secretary of Interior Ken Salazar issued a secretarial order implementing the sweeping new wilderness policy for the Bureau of Land Management, or BLM. This order directed BLM to de designate areas within the wilder with wilderness characteristics as, quote, wild lands. The term wild lands may, may be new, but the administration's motives are not. This order is a clear attempt to allow the administration to create de facto wilderness areas without congressional approval. I have repeated, repeatedly stated that oversight of the Obama administration's actions will be a top priority of this committee. It's decisions such as this that make our oversight role a necessity. Today's hearing will allow us to closely examine the impacts of the wild lands order and hear directly from governors and local officials on its effect upon jobs and the economies of the communities across the West. The administration chose not to consult or listen to these elected leaders or their communities before the secretarial order was dictated. This hearing provides them the first forum and opportunity for them to be heard by their elected government. That is not, in my view, how our system is supposed to, get to work. Again, that is why the specific purpose of this hearing was to hear from the state and local leaders. Additional hearings are planned. I want to mention that again. Additional hearings are planned, including one featuring department officials and allowing them a full forum to discuss and defend the secretarial order. The administration was eager, however, to also participate in today's hearing and requested an opportunity for BLM Director Abbey to testify. As chairman, I honored this request from the administration with the understanding that previously invited citizens traveling here to Washington, D.C. to appear as witnesses were not to be displaced. So to, to accommodate Director Abbey, the hearing has been restructured to con condense all of the local witnesses on one second panel, which I know is going to be a tight squeeze. Director Abbey will appear on our final panel, panel, and I intend to move the hearing along as, as quickly as we can so we all get a fair uh, hearing on this. Before examining the widespread impacts of this order, the administration's lack of legal authority to impose such a policy deserves emphasis. The Wilderness Act of 1964 very clearly gives Congress, and only Congress, the statutory authority to, to create new wilderness areas. It's absurd for the Obama administration to claim that giving wilderness a different label of wild lands will somehow pass legal muster. Clever semantics cannot circumvent the law. I will ask specifically where this authority comes from. Under this wild lands order, approximately 220 million acres of BLM land, the majority of which is in the West, is under threat of being treated as de facto wilderness. Designating land as wilderness imposes the most restrictive land use policies. Lands that are currently used for multiple purpose, including recreation activities, agriculture, ranching, American energy production, and other activities are in danger of being placed off limits. This secretarial order will dis disproportionately impact rural communities who depend on public lands for their livelihoods. These communities have already been hit hard by onerous existing federal restrictions and by the current economic crisis. They suffer from some of the highest unemployment rates in the country. The wild lands order threatens to inflict further economic pain. This is just one more example of the onslaught of harm harmful actions that the Obama administration is opposing on rural America. The administration claims that this order will be good for jobs. How does preventing public access to public lands result in new jobs? If this was such a boon to local jobs, then why did they bury this order's announcement 
on December 23rd, just two days before Christmas. More job loss is what this order threatens, in my view. I'm eager to hear from the Western governors and local officials who can tell us firsthand how it will impact their jobs in their states, and I'm also to hear the opposite view. This secretarial order is a clear invitation for lawsuits and will lead to further divisions among groups and communities over the loose use of public lands. This order will tie the hands of BLM land managers who may fear that any decision will land them in court and delay the reasonable and responsible use of our public lands. I believe in responsible stewardship. There is a need to care for our most treasured national lands. Yet, multi-purpose public lands must remain open to public enjoyment and available to help build our economy and create jobs. The local communities to who depend on this land must be a part of the process, not after the fact, not once the Secretary has issued his order, but from the beginning. This administration should be on notice that unilateral decisions and orders to impose restrictive, job-destroying policies will be met with firm resistance. And with that, I, I look forward to hearing testimony. Before that, I'll recognize the distinguished ranking chairman, the gentleman from Massachusetts. I thank the gentleman very much. No issue has been more hotly debated in this committee than wilderness, and no issue is more misunderstood. Criticism of Secretary Salazar's wild lands order is based on misconceptions that have plagued this debate for decades. For example, some see wilderness inventories as attempts to transform multiple use lands into wilderness. This is a fundamental misunderstanding of the purpose of the Wilderness Act, which is, quote, to secure for the American people the benefits of an enduring resource of wilderness. Properly understood, wilderness is a resource, just like timber or natural gas. The Wilderness Act could no more create wilderness than the mining law could create gold. The Act directs land managers to find wilderness so that Congress can preserve it for future generations. The Bush administration did not want Congress to preserve wilderness, so they volunteered to stop looking for it. Secretarial Order 3310 directs BLM to rejoin the hunt for wilderness as required by the Act. In other words, Secretarial Order 3310 is an announcement that Secretary Salazar, unlike several of his predecessors, is ready to do his job and just in time, because the Bush no more wilderness policy was having the desired effect. The Bureau of Land Management has leased five times as much public land to oil and gas companies as it has set aside for wilderness. Over the last five years, the BLM found more than 18,000 new sites for oil and gas wells, but not a single new site for potential wilderness. The BLM has been approving drilling permits so fast that energy companies can't keep up. They are only producing on about one-third of the acres already leased. Among the drilling rigs and the mining sites and the off-the-road vehicle areas on our public lands, there is plenty of room to at least look for any wilderness that may remain. Another misconception is that wilderness is somehow bad for local economies. While the nation and even the world are currently suffering through a difficult recession, the story of most communities in the West since the Wilderness Act uh, was enacted in 1964 has been one of explosive growth and prosperity, much of it driven by tourism, recreation, and a rich quality of life all based on an abundance of beautiful open space. Secretarial Order 3310 does not designate a single acre of wilderness. It will not impede oil and gas production. It does not burden local communities. And it is fully consistent with congressional intent, something that cannot be said about the policy it overturns. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to the testimony of our witnesses.
I thank the gentleman for his, uh, for his statement, and I want to welcome our first panel, Governor Otter and Governor Herbert, and I'll yield for purposes of introduction to uh, our two colleagues on the committee. First of all, the uh, new member of our committee, uh, Congressman Labrador, to introduce Governor Otter, and, and Congressman Bishop to introduce uh, his governor, Governor Herbert, Governor, uh, Mr. Labrador. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is indeed an honor to be able to introduce Idaho's 32nd governor to this committee. I say introduce, but the truth is that Butch Otter is no stranger to this committee, having been an active member of it during his time in Congress. I am privileged to list my name alongside his as representatives of Idaho's first congressional district, where he served until he became governor in 2006. Mr. Otter also served with distinction in the Idaho legislature and served as Lieutenant Governor and President of the Senate from 1986 until 2001, when he was elected to the seat I now, I, I now hold. His time in Congress was marked by a focus on conservative principles and an outspoken advocacy for a limited federal government. Mr. Otter comes to us today as not just an expert in Western land use issues, and I'm looking forward to hearing your misconceptions about Western land use issues, since you apparently don't know enough about it, but uh, also as an expert in economic development. Much of his early career was spent engaging in the types of activities politicians today hope to achieve, increasing exports, exports of domestic products, making Idaho a competitive place to do business, and creating jobs for Americans. Please join me in welcoming, and also I'd like to recognize his wife, the First Lady, Lori Otter. Uh, please join me in welcoming Mr. Otter back to this committee. Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Bishop, for purpose of introduction. Thank you. I'm pleased to welcome uh, Gary Herbert, who's the uh, governor of the state of Utah, recently elected to fulfill the term of his predecessor, and I'm appreciative of him being here, as well as his lovely wife, who is sitting behind him even though it comes from Utah County, which is someplace down in some other district, I don't know, in the state of the Utah. What is significant, though, for Governor Herbert is he spent a significant amount of time first in local government as a county commissioner, which is in our hybrid Galveston system, both a legislative and executive function. He clearly understands the distinction between those two, and then having a wide background, which made him extremely popular, especially with all the local elected officials in the state of Utah, to become a governor, first as lieutenant governor, in which these issues were one of his primary focuses. He was assigned to that area, and now as governor, in which once again the federal-state relationship, as well as what public lands means to the state of Utah, is still a prime focus. So I'm very proud of what you do for the state of Utah and our citizens. We're welcome and happy to have you here. Uh, I yield to the ranking member just for a moment. I, I, thank, the, uh, I thank the gentleman. Um, we're here at an historic time, um, and that time is to recognize our colleague, Rush Holt from New Jersey, who last night defeated in a game of Jeopardy the IBM supercomputer Watson. Uh, and uh, Rush is a five-time Jeopardy winner in real life and a nuclear physicist. Um, uh, and, uh, but I think uh, beating uh, the supercomputer Watson when all hope had failed for humanity to prevail over technology, you know, I think is something that we should recognize. Well, well, since there's that much wisdom, there's hope, uh, there's hope in the future as we debate these issues, then welcome. <laughs> I want to thank you and I want to welcome Governor Otter and Gov Governor Herbert. Like all of our witnesses, your written testimony will appear in full in the, in the record, so I ask that you keep your oral statements to uh, five minutes. The microphones in front of you are not automatic, so before you, before you start, press the button. And the timing lights, let me explain, I know Governor Otter knows this, but when you start, the green light will come on after four minutes, the yellow light comes on, signifying you have one minute, and when the red light comes on, uh, you know, wrap it up as quickly as you possibly can. So with that, Governor Otter, you may begin. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's uh, my pleasure to be here on behalf of the State of Idaho. I want to thank you, Chairman Hastings, and also Ranking Member Markey, uh, for the opportunity to come before this committee and explain the concerns that Idahoans have surrounding Interior Secretary Salazar, Secretarial Order Number 3310. After Secretary Salazar's order was released, there have been numerous interest groups, members of Congress, and several governors, including myself and my colleague to my left, who have conveyed great frustration and deep concern 
over this designation. The Secretary's wild lands policy has placed a higher priority on protection of wilderness characteristics and regulated other than multiple use to a position of lesser importance. This drastic change in public policy for public lands was done without public input. With land use decisions shifted to Washington, D.C., the legitimate rights of states and the peoples of those states to have input on activities within their borders has been disregarded. Once lands are designated as wild lands by the BLM, multiple use becomes greatly restricted. These restrictions were signified and have the impact the, on the construction of new infrastructure. For example, critical transmission corridors and the operation and maintenance of existing facilities on these very lands. Every project will require a new NEPA analysis. These new steps offer opponents of ongoing projects and new adventures to delay them all. The order potentially makes the process for citing new energy-related projects even more difficult. Essentially, it represents an even greater chilling effect on developers who already view access to BLM-managed property as a daunting task. More importantly, the implementation of this order could impact energy projects that have already begun and spent millions of dollars on projects in, in the current permitting process. In Idaho, several significant energy-related projects, and might I add, totally green energy projects, such as China Mountain, Wind, Gateway West Transmission, border, Boardman to Hemingway Transmission, are already fully engaged in the right-of-way signing process. There is no indication that these projects would be spared from the potential impacts of this order. The BLM has a history of being paralyzed by the mere threat of lawsuits and any pending decisions that are likely to be delayed for months, if not years. The order provides several new avenues for the anti-progress groups to challenge BLM's decisions, which eventually will lead to endless litigation. There is a concern about funding and manpower to complete projects currently in progress while BLM's manpower is redirected to re-inventorying lands for wilderness characteristics. How does the BLM implement such a vast undertaking without undermining projects already underway. Congress has indicated that they will not fund the BLM to conduct these new wilderness inventories. There is a speculation, admit us already, that BLM will require anyone seeking a permit to pay for the wilderness inventory on the footprint of the project in the surrounding areas. The impact to energy projects and grazers and present multiple use could be horrendous. The BLM contends in its own talking points that this new policy will have no effect on lands that are not under BLM's jurisdiction. Simply look at the map over here to my far left. In the yellow, yellow area are the BLM lands. And that these lands of the western states, as you look at it, you will see that the state and private lands are intermingled with endowment lands of the states. Issues of access and management have not been addressed. The secretarial order has the potential to economically impact the state endowment, endowment lands, which are the benefits primarily for our school children. The Omnibus Public Lands Management Act of 2009 designated a new wilderness of 117,000 acres of Owyhee County in Idaho, in southwest Idaho, as wilderness. Area, area acres were released to be managed for multiple use. This collaborative effect, effort, excuse me, championed by Senator Mike Crapo for years and now approved by Congress is now in jeopardy. The partners in this endeavor are concerned that whether or not the parcels released as a result of that agreement in the de facto wilderness designation of the wilderness study areas will now be re-inventoried as lands with wilderness characteristics and could be recognized as wild lands. Under the planning rules outlined by BLM directive, it only follows that lands previously deemed wilderness study areas would become wild lands. If this happens as BLM follows the Secretary's planning procedures, 
any future state and local collaborative efforts such as the Hawaii Canyonlands with the federal agencies will be jeopardized. The public will have no confidence in the federal government's process. Secretary Salazar has circumvented the authority not only of Congress in the process of designated wilderness areas, but the input of the public and the effect on Western states and states' rights. This reflects the same type of top-down, one-size-fits-all management approach that Idaho was subjected to during the waning hours of the Clinton administration during the Forest Service roadless rule. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I urge Congress to take back its authority and prevent further development and implementation of Secretary Salazar's order. This order exempts stakeholders, threatens the spirit of collaboration and cooperation, weakens the process, discounts state sovereignty, and sends the message to the citizens of Idaho and every state in the West. The federal government will continue to treat the valuable and diverse open spaces of the West, not as lands of many uses, but rather as lands of no use and no access for the people who live and work in Idaho and other Western states. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Governor Otter. Governor Herbert. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank uh, to all of you for this opportunity to share my concerns about this bureaucratically established policy that dramatically impacts our way of life in the West and is, I believe, detrimental to our entire nation. I recognize that the relationship between the states and the federal government is a partnership. But unfortunately, we're here today because the partnership between the states and the federal government was recently ignored by an action of the United States Department of the, of the Interior. This decision just casually casts aside an agreement that was entered into more than a decade ago between the governor of the state of Utah and the secretary of the U.S. Department of Interior. That agreement was reached in order to avoid litigation and to provide certainty to, for those who rely on consistent, clear management policies of the BLM lands. Instead, this new order will likely lead, lead to renewed litigation while slamming the door shut on citizens and communities that are seeking certainty in the public lands management process. I urge you as representatives and as our partners to undo the damage that is being done by Secretarial Order 3310 and reaffirm a congressionally established process that established clarity and certainty in the management of our public lands. In my state, we have beautiful and resource-rich lands that support both a strong energy development industry and a vibrant outdoor recreation industry. There are some who will tell you that you can only have one or the other, that it is somehow a zero-sum game. I'm here to tell you that is simply and particularly not true in Utah. With new innovative technology, we can protect the environment while at the same time developing our natural resources in ways that were never imagined a few years ago. We have millions of acres of open land, more than enough for development and more than enough for recreation. We have worked for years to bring varying groups and opinions together for the mutual benefit of our entire state economy and that also of the nation. Mr. Chairman, this secretarial order has undone years of this collaborative and costly work between county officials, environmental organizations, natural resource industries, citizens, and our local B Bureau of Land Management people as they have worked together to craft BLM resource management plans throughout our state. This order changed the rules right at the end of the game, the results of which are having a profoundly negative impact on public lands protection and natural resource development in Utah. It is harming numerous rural communities throughout Utah whose economies do rely on sound and consistent public lands management practices. Due to this order, the economies in places like Roosevelt, Vernal, Price, Kanab, Castledale, Blanding, and Panguitch are going to be harmed. We are being told by oil and gas exploration companies that due to regulatory uncertainty that they will now curb their activities in Utah. They will not invest the time nor the capital necessary to prepare new bids on new exploration until the regulatory situation is steady. This lack, the lack of this new investment means not only a loss of jobs for Utah residents, but also the loss of natural resources that only increase our nation's dependence on fuel from foreign countries. I don't know if you checked the price of a gallon of gas lately, but this secretary order isn't going to help out one little bit at the pump. Taking an inventory is important for our public lands. 
But how many times do we need to inventory and re-inventory the same land? We've already been through this inventory process in Utah, and the only reason to ask for yet another inventory is to establish a wilderness designation through a de facto bureaucratic process. The continual re-inventorying of federal lands as required by Secretarial Order 3310 is wasteful and I believe wrong. It is justifiable only by politics and not by good policy. This order also directly impacts in Utah school children. Like most other western states, Utah's granted land at statehood for the financial support of K-12 public education and other state institutions. Utah owns 3.3 million acres of school state trust lands interspersed amongst the BLM land. It is safe to say that the long-term effect of this policy will be the loss of billions of dollars to the permanent school fund and ongoing losses in endowment income for each public and charter school in Utah. This order also hinders our state's ability to develop a long-term sound energy plan. It hinders the ability of all public land states to develop their own natural resources. And this action serves not to benefit any one group, but to endanger the safety and economic well-being of our entire nation. In closing, this body and your colleagues ought to be just as offended as the people of Utah are by this order. This action simply usurps the authority of Congress and for the first time ever creates a favored category for multiple use management creates new levels of centralized bureaucratic review, contains vague, inconsistent, and overly broad definitions of wild lands, and lacks clarity as to what is wilderness and what is subject to multiple use and development. By bureaucratic fiat, one branch of the government has overstepped and overreached and has devalued the rights of the, of the states and of, the, of its citizens. I urge you on behalf of the people of Utah and for the benefit of the people of our entire nation to exercise the congressional oversight that you have to correct this grave error and to return reason, certainty, and balance to the management of our public lands. I thank you for your time and look forward to your questions. I thank both of you for your uh, testimony and this, uh, this hearing is a start of what you requested, Governor Herbert. Uh, questions, we'll now start the question. Each member will have five minutes for the question and answer and I will start. And this is a question for both uh, of you. Idaho has over 11 million acres of BLM land and Utah double that, 22 million acres. So you are clearly heavily impacted by this order. But we hear assertions, at least in coming from this, in from, from this administration and, and here today, that this is a good way to bring jobs to uh, your area. So let me just ask very specifically to both of you. In your state, do families have a bit better job opportunities in multiple use areas or in areas subject to wilderness restrictions? And I'll start with you, Governor Otter. Uh, the answer to that, Mr. Chairman, is no. Uh, the multiple use characteristics that we have enjoyed for years uh, in Idaho has created a lot of jobs. Uh, the promise, uh, if we can continue under the multiple use characteristics, of these lands has a, has a great opportunity for many more jobs. As I explained in my testimony, we now have four different power lines that are trying to get across southern Idaho, mostly through the 14 and a half million acres of BLM land in Idaho. Uh, from where it's produced, from where the power is produced uh, on wind farms in Idaho, geothermal and solar farms, uh, to the southern markets in Las Vegas and in Los Angeles. In order to get that power from where it's produced to where it's going, we have to create these power corridors. So we have to construct power lines. We have to, and then we have to maintain them. We have to have access to be able to maintain them. So I see it as a job killer. Governor Herbert. Well, thank you. Um, I don't see it having any advantage to improving the economy of Utah. I, I think it does, in fact, have a depressing effect. We have uh, good outdoor recreation. We have good tourism. Our tourism has increased the last few years. Uh, this order doesn't do anything but reevaluate what we already have. I don't think it will, at the end of the day, change the, the categorization of wilderness and that this non-wilderness in, in one little bit. Uh, we'll still have multiple use of the public lands in the same fashion we have now. All this does is bring uncertainty to the marketplace, and it hurts our industry folks that want to invest millions of dollars in natural resource development, which we certainly need to have in Utah, in particular our rural parts of Utah, which also enhances the opportunity for us to have some energy sustain sustainability in the country. So this does not help my economy one bit. Good, thank you, and I have one more question. Uh, to what extent 
were both of you uh, consulted in December before this order, this, this order, this order was promulgated on, <laughs> on December 23rd. Uh, and uh, uh, Governor Herbert, I'd like to start with you since this order, as you mentioned in your testimony, ended a settlement agreement of 2003. So to what extent were you consulted on this in this matter? Well, uh, maybe that's one of the great disappointments to me in this whole thing because I've, as a Republican governor, reached out in a significant way to Secretary of Interior Salazar. And we've worked very diligently together to come together with a balanced approach in Utah on this issue. Uh, I've got the leading Democrat in Utah that heads up my balanced resource council in trying to bring people together and try to find a balanced approach to, to manage our public lands. And so when I was called uh, just two days before Christmas as I was going out to uh, pass out some turkeys to the homeless folks as part of our traditional Christmas effort, I was surprised for him to tell me, oh, by the way, in, in a couple of hours we're going to have a press conference in Colorado. You ought to be aware of what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to designate this new category called wildlands. That was the total amount of my input before we, I heard about it. I said, can you postpone the, the news conference so I can understand what you're talking about? And of course, the answer was no. To Bob Babby's credit, he, uh, he came out and visited with our folks a few weeks later. But we had no opportunity to give input, no consultation, no, by the way, what is your opinion? Real quickly, Governor Otter. Same story, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we did not find out about it until after uh, the press conference, and it was disappointing. And it was disappointing on a couple of fronts, as Governor Herbert has already alluded to, uh, because we were in negotiations on trying to solve the wolf problem in Idaho, and I had met personally with the Secretary and many of his staff members in early December, and then I was on the phone with, in conversations uh, with them again in uh, the second week of December. And nothing was mentioned about this. Naturally, we were talking about uh, the wolf situation, but I would have thought that a courtesy with such a tremendous economic impact on the state of Idaho that I would have at least gotten the courtesy of a heads up. I got no such heads up, no such courtesy. Good. Uh, listen, thank you very much for your testimony. My time has expired, and I recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey. Thank the, uh, I thank the chair. Um, good to see you again, Butch. Welcome back. Thank um, you. How would you suggest that good collaborative wilderness proposals should be developed if no wilderness inventories can be uh, conducted uh, and if the areas that are identified aren't preserved until Congress can act or not act? How, how would you propose that, that the inventory ever be established? Well. Uh I guess what concerns us most, uh, Mr. Murky, is the process. Uh, and a courtesy not unlike was warranted when I was uh, in the Congress, uh, when there was some wind farms going to go up in, let's say, a place like Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket, that in both cases, uh, at least the federal agency that had oversight and could have uh, could have, uh, would have approached those people that were concerned about it, that concern was offered to them at that time. Now, now, there was no wilderness study out there in the Bay, uh, but I would tell you that just the courtesy of these agencies, and especially this agency, which can have such a tremendous impact on our economies, uh, of letting us know that this was something that was going to come forward, I think uh, that we could have probably showed them one of a stack uh, quite high that would have said, well, here's all the wilderness studies that we areas that we did on roadless rule when we finally came to an agreement. And I would remind you that Idaho's roadless rule is the only rule that has been accepted because we worked together on it. We were notified ahead of time. And so I think there's plenty of studies on wilderness. If there's something else, uh, and, and by the way, in, in your opening statement, uh, uh, ranking member, you indicated that this is not wilderness, this is wildlands. And I would refer you to the very wording in that secretarial order, lands with wilderness characteristics. If it walks like a duck in the west and it quacks like a duck in the west, we figure it's a duck. Okay, but what, once they find a potential area, then full NEPA protections are in place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there is a process, and, and that process is uh, something that uh, they have to go through in a public way uh, before anything, you know, happens. And so, uh, and so whether it be Nantucket Sound or it be 
you know, uh, in this area as well. That those are the rules. That's the law, and right. and that process is in place as part of this uh, secretarial order. I understand that, but at the very uncertainty that my colleague uh, talked about. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what happened to the land values in Nantucket Sound when all of a sudden it was announced that there might be a huge wind farm uh, out there in the area of an otherwise place that was had a viewscape that was more desirable than perhaps the one that the wind farm would have offered. Uh, but I can tell you that it has created just the very question of whether or not we're once again changing the rules, and more importantly, we're changing the rules, I repeat, without public input, mm -hmm. without congressional approval, uh, without a process that should be second nature to this country. Let me let me go to Governor Herbert. Good to see you again. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, Not twice sure. in the same day. My I'm lucky spend day. The whole day <laughs> together. Um, it, it, less than two percent of um, BLM land in um, Utah is wilderness, and 22 percent of BLM land in Utah is for oil and gas drilling. Okay, so. That's the balance. It's 11 to 1, oil and gas drilling opposed to wilderness areas. So uh, that's something I think that's quite clear. But at the same time, um, your state has um, a $6.2 billion a year tourism industry uh, that is related to kind of the sense that we have back in the East that it's a beautiful area of the country with all of this wonderful wilderness. So. You have a balance that is struck that your state is a financial beneficiary of it, so that even though you have a $6.2 billion tourism industry, you also have the billions of dollars that come in from the oil and gas on the 22 percent of the land which is leased for that. So it seems to me that's, that's something that's already factored in and that there is a process, as I said with Governor Otter, you know, for NEPA to be invoked and for all of those protections from a public participation perspective to have to be uh, finished before anything permanent is ever concluded. Well, uh, again, I, I don't know it's a matter of just keeping the score. Uh, if that's the case, you can see by looking at the map that Governor Otter's brought here that at least the West has a disproportionate share of wilderness uh, as opposed to the East Coast. And so it's a matter of just keeping the score. It's a matter of is it in fact wilderness based on the law? I don't have a problem with wilderness. I'm not anti-wilderness. Uh, we've started inventorying in Utah, ba finished the, f uh, the first one in 1993 and turned the report into this uh, body here. Uh, we started again in 1997 and re-inventoried again. Um, I guess the question is going to be how many times do you inventory? If we go to the closet and I say, hey, how many suits have I got in the closet? I've got seven. I can come back uh, you know, a week later and count them again. i still got seven. Uh, there's got to be a, a time when we finish the process and say, okay, this is really it and move ahead with some certainty and predictability. We have in the state of Utah, as part of this process, RMPs, resource management plans. We've spent six, seven, eight years in bringing people together, environmental groups, industry groups, groups, local uh, community leaders, and others saying, this is how we will manage these lands. And now with this new wildlands designation, those resource management plans are essentially, we don't know what they mean now. Again, we're being in uncertainty. A a again, I'm just saying, we ought to inventory once and get it done. Let me just say that's just not a map of the wilderness area. That's a map of all BLM yeah, land. That's right. In Utah, only 2% is wilderness. And 22% is oil and gas, and much of the rest is haze and other purposes. So the, the time of the yeah, gentleman yeah, has, yeah. has expired. If I might, Mr. Okay. Chairman, I, I would just point out that uh, that's right. If we had the wilderness in the area in there, that map would be much, much, uh, have much more color in it. You're right, yeah. Mr. Murphy. Yeah, if it had uh, national parks, uh, it'd be even more larger than that. Uh, I'm advised we may have a vote around 3:15 uh, or thereabouts. Uh, so uh, this time, I'd recognize the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Bishop. Look, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I understand there's going to be a couple of rounds here, at least, Mr. Chairman. I understand there's going to be a couple of rounds. I do have questions for both of them, but I would be remiss if I didn't yield to my colleague from Idaho to at least ask his governor a couple of questions first, so I'd like to yield to him first. G I do have recognized. questions when we come back at some other point. Gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have a couple of questions, uh, Governor Otter. Um, one of the issues that we're struggling with in Idaho is how to deal with the invasive plant species. 
And while this wildlands program is supposed to help keep areas natural, I'm worried that it could actually have the opposite effect and allow invasive species like cheatgrass to choke out uh, native species. Do you think that's a legitimate concern? Well, thank you very much, Mr. Labrador, for that question. Uh, I would re my first year as governor of the state of Idaho, we had a wildlands fire which lasted about two and a half weeks and burnt over 700,000 acres. 700,000 acres of land that uh, uh, we use for multi uh, multiple use, but also, more importantly, was critical habitat for the sage grouse, for slick spot pepper grass, and for bull trout, just to name uh, three species that ruined not only the watersheds, but it ruined the habitat. Now, what happens after a wildfire is always an invasive species, which we call cheatgrass, uh, recovers quicker than the rest of the native grasses and, in fact, squeezes those out. As a result of that, we're constantly susceptible to more wildfires because nothing eats the cheatgrass, uh, nothing habitates in it, and it only becomes fine fuels for one of the 1,400 lightning strikes that we get during our storm season in Idaho every summer. So it becomes very detrimental and very expensive to the state. That first year, my fire bill alone was $23 million. Now, it seems like we already have plenty of rules to create wilderness. Uh, wh why do you think that uh, we're th the, the Interior Secretary is trying to create a new process that goes beyond uh, the, the existing rules? Well, we've had an awful lot of experience, uh, Mr. Labrador, Mr. Chairman. We've had an awful lot of experience in Idaho with wilderness because we got the largest contiguous wilderness in the uh, 48 uh, lower states. And uh, I would tell you that it's, it's a surprise to me because when that original wilderness bill was passed, uh, the river of no return, statements were made, statements were advanced and purported uh, in the United States Senate, in the House of Representatives, when that bill was, which is now referred to as the Frank Church River of No Return uh, Wilderness, is that this is the last acre that we will ever ask for wilderness again. And so it's, it's always a surprise. I wish that I could answer that question. I wish somebody would have asked us, do you agree that there should be more wilderness in Idaho? And if so, where? I say again, in 2009, we created 517,000 acres of more wilderness in the state of Idaho at the request of Senator Crapo, and the Congress passed that bill. Uh, that we, we constantly are asked about additional wilderness, and our congressmen here uh, in uh, representing the state of Idaho and our senators uh, are the ones that advance that. So we have plenty of input. Do I agree with all of them? Absolutely not. Uh, but I would at least like to have the opportunity for the chief executive of the 43rd star in that American flag to say yes or no. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Can you yield back to me? Thank you. Um, let me do a couple of things here. Uh, Governor Herbert, very quickly, I have no idea how much time I have left here. I'll never get through this. Um, it is right, we have 2% of the BLM land that's wilderness. Of course, that doesn't include Forest Service wilderness, national parks, the rest of it. The reality is, Utah has 10% private property. So congratulations to being governor over 10% of Utah. <laughs> the rest, you're the regional administrator for Mr. Abbey. Yeah. <laughs> what I'd like to ask, though, is your concern about the continuity of jobs. And like, like I said, there will probably be another round here. You only got a couple of seconds there. Are we losing jobs to other areas of the United States because of these positions, realizing the West has the highest unemployment of any region in the nation? Yes. Uh, again, with the changes and the uncertainty that's been caused by throwing out of the RMP process and uh, withdrawal of 77 oil and gas leases, a lot of the people in the industry now are concerned about, are we going to spend six, seven years going through this process, investing millions of dollars, and then have the rug pulled out from underneath us at the end of the process? And so they're going to be looking at more private land states where they don't have to go through this process. There's more certainty to it, more predictability. And I think you'll hear later on from some of the local government people that's impacting their backyards dramatically. But again, it's intuitive to understand. If you don't understand, if I invest and I have some potential for a good outcome, that you're going to invest someplace else where the, where the outcome is more certain. Time of the gentleman has expired. I ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce, be allowed to sit on the committee and participate in the hearing without objection, so ordered. You have a lot of friends, Steve. <laughs> uh, Mr. Grijalva, recognized for five minutes.
that uh, that some oil and gas activities, uh, oil and gas, gas companies, uh, will likely curb their uh, activities um, in your in your state because of uh, the wildlands policy. Uh, there's almost five million acres of land in your uh, in the state that are that is open right now to oil and gas drilling. Uh, only 22 percent of that land is actively being leased and is in production. So the question for me is, uh, isn't it true there are millions of acres of land open for more drilling and it's not being utilized and, and, and in production at this point? Well, that probably is true. Uh, and probably that question would be better directed to industry that can tell you why it's available. I can tell you that my belief is that uh, it's not viable economically or they'd be drilling it. Some of it's isolated land that's in a remote location and you need to combine acreage in the aggregate so that it becomes economically viable to do it. So uh, again, that's part and parcel of the process. Uh, you might have the right to go to some place and drill, but you might not have any, any resource there to drill. I mean, it may be a dry hole kind of a location. So there's a lot of factors that go into why uh, the industry drills where they do, drill. But the, the, the problem is, given the, the certainty of if we drill, at least we have an op or if we play the game, and in some instances, this has been six, seven, eight years, and then say, oh, by the way, we're going to change the rules. They're going to say, you know what? I don't think I want to play here anymore. I'll go to where it's a private land state where we don't have so many hoops to go through. We have a better chance of success. Let, if I may again, if I could follow up, Governor, uh, the, la the 2008 census indicated that 13% of the jobs in, in your state were around uh, travel and tourism. 1% was in the uh, oil, gas, and mining industries. Uh, tourism and other industries, uh, is, so my question is, is, is one industry more important than the other in terms of this job creation issue, given the disparity in terms of job creation? I, I don't think one job is more important than another job or that one industry is more important than another industry. Again, I reject the notion, and it's, it, it's going to be perpetuated here, what I, which I think is false, that is somehow tourism and development of our natural resources are somehow mutually exclusive. That's not true. And I can prove the point. We've worked very hard with our Balanced Resource Council to bring industry together, our environmental community in a place called uh, the West Havaputs in Nine Mile Canyon and a centralized county called Carbon County in the, in the middle of Utah. Uh, they had original proposals for around 800 natural gas wells to be drilled. By negotiation, by working together and finding the compromise point, we've cut down 200 of those wells, less surface interruption, more lateral drilling, protected the rock art okay. and other uh, uh, environmental issues that have been addressed there with an agreement. Now that location, they'll have uh, each one of those natural gas wells is about $700,000, $800,000. An oil gas well is about a million dollars. But that over the next 10 to 15 years, there'll be over a billion dollars invested in that part of our state. That's a significant amount of money and economic development for a rural part of Utah. Okay. So it, it's, uh, yeah, again, it's not yeah. one or the other. They both can exist uh, harm, uh, harmoniously. No, I, and I appreciate that, Governor. My question was not about the qualitative nature of, of, of uh, uh, what's going on in your state in terms of uh, the balance of natural resource use. Mine was a quantitative question about number of jobs per industry and acreage available for oil and gas and mining exploration that are not being utilized. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman, the uh, gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Fleming. I thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, governors. Thank you uh, for coming today. Um, I'm from Louisiana, and we're not directly impacted by this, but uh, I will have empathy for the issues you, that you're dealing with. Here's my question, or my first question. Hopefully, I can get to my second one. The impact of the administration's wildlands order 3310 has serious ramifications for our domestic energy supply and distribution. Today, AAA cited the national average cost of regular gasoline as $3.34. This summer, oil prices are expected to skyrocket. 
with more and more turmoil in the middle east it is imperative that we seek domestic seek to domestically meet our energy concerns as a matter of national security not to mention our economy utah and idaho are home to a vast array of potential energy sources on and across public lands from renewable energy sources like wind and geothermal to natural gas reserves and both conventional oil reserves as well as shale oil specifically how will order 3310 affect current and future energy development on the land designated as wilderness characteristics uh, one, uh, let's start with the governor otter please Idaho uh, does not have a lot of uh, gas and oil. We, we were recently, as the last, uh, as la the last three or four months, we actually hit a gas well uh, in Idaho, and it's the first natural gas well. It's sweet gas. Uh, uh, we have to demoisturize it a little bit, but other than that, 4.2 million cubic feet of natural gas, and uh, that's a first for Idaho. We haven't had oil. We haven't had uh, uh, gas before, but but we expect to have that now. Uh, in answering your question, 35 million acres, or roughly 65 percent of the state of Idaho, is quote unquote federal land, comes under federal designation. Uh, obviously, uh, getting that gas from where it is, we're going to have to end up going across some federal ground someplace. And so, but, but getting that gas from uh, where it's being produced to where it can be consumed or at least utilized into a gas line that's going to take it someplace else. We're going to have to have certainty that we can get across uh, those lands. Simply asking the question, what are we going to designate as wilderness areas has put everything on hold and will continue to put everything on hold in Idaho. One of the things that we've been off, uh, been concerned about is the upward mobility of our citizens. Uh, we know, and uh, in answer to a previous question, we know right now, and we have experienced even with that only that one gas well, that citizens or that, that people that work on gas and oil production, gas and oil development, laying of pipelines, uh, in that industry, make a whole lot more money than somebody that makes a bed or serves a tourist someplace. So we're, we're concerned about our workforce and we're concerned about our citizenry and their upward mobility. I don't want to relegate any of them forever to making beds or serving ham and eggs for breakfast to a tourist. Okay. Governor Hurwitz? Yes, thank you. Uh, just to give you an example, in the Uinta Basin, which is kind of at the eastern uh, border between uh, Utah and Colorado, at Uinta Basin, 60% of our oil and gas income, or oil and gas development represents 60% of the income in that part of our state. So a rather large uh, uh, amount of economic development is tied to that uh, opportunity. Uh, I think all of us understand the laws of supply and demand, and so we have a demand for energy right now that's going up. And our supplies are somewhat limited, so the prices uh, of anything related to energy are going to go up, up, and up, including uh, the price of the pump. Uh, I know you've had a tra the tragedy in the Gulf uh, there with the oil spill. I, I don't think any of us uh, are insensitive to that, but it would certainly be a lot easier to clean up if the oil was in the middle of Utah. Uh, we, ha we just discovered some new oil in the central part of Utah in uh, an area called Sevier County, maybe up to a billion barrels of oil. Opportunities to go out there and explore and have risk and reward and increase the supply of oil and natural gas is going to help this uh, economy of ours recover. It's going to help keep the cost of energy down and clearly gives us, gives us competitive advantage in the marketplace in the world. So uh, more supply is going to help us, and we can do it today with new technology in environmentally sensitive ways so they don't have to be a mutually exclusive approach. Um, would you agree, just short answers here, I'm running out of time. Would you both agree this, that this is an amazing overreach by the administration substituting itself for the powers of the Congress of the United States as well as the states themselves? Yes. That's short. Yeah. I, I don't know if it's amazed, if I'm amazed, but it is certainly a concern. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it is an overreach. And we ought to have been working a little better together on this to, to come up with this approach. That's the disappointing part to me. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Heinrich. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to start out by saying, as a former wilderness guide, it, it didn't relegate me to anything. I seem to have done fairly well uh, since then. 
And one of the things that I think has been at the heart of this, of, of your testimony up to now, both of you governors, has been the issue around process and consultation. Uh, and certainly with NEPA, with FLIPFA, with all of these federal uh, planning processes that we have, the RMP process, um, that's important. Asking people their opinions, asking governors their opinions and citizens their opinions. What I wanted to ask both of you is, when the Bush administration overturned the, the, uh, the process, the, the federal 202 process, which is very similar in nature to this wildland process, it was inexistent throughout the 1990s, was, uh, was ended by the Bush administration. They did that with no formal consultation to local elected officials, uh, no formal consultation to the public. Did you register the same objections uh, when they unilaterally ended the 202 process that you're registering now? Uh, no, I did not because I agreed with it. So it's so what you're saying, Governor Otter, is not that you care about the process but the outcome. Well, of course I care about the outcome and of course I care about the process. Uh, but the, the reason I'm here today is because we were totally ignored in that process. Uh, you know, it's evidenced by what's going on around the United States today that if you disagree with something, you show up at the state capitol uh, and you let folks know exactly how you feel. Well, Governor, my point is that the process is important no matter which side you're on. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it, we should hold that up as an example. The Bush administration got rid of the 202 process and they did it without asking local elected officials, city councilors like myself at the time, what they thought about that. I want to move on real quickly to the, the point that you bring up about certainty, which I also think is very important. And, um, and Governor Herbert, you, you articulated that very well. To, to really create certainty for these lands, wouldn't it be, um, wouldn't the best way to do that would be to actually pass legislation that looked at these lands and either designated them as wilderness or released them uh, to other multiple uses? Well, again, I guess I thought we had done that. Uh, and I know that we completed a process in 1993. It was then uh, re-inventoried by a good Democrat, Bruce Babbitt, uh, and that completed that process, started in 1997, completed in 1999. It spurred litigation, which we ended up having a stipulation and a settlement that, that led to that years later. But again, I, I won't defend the indefensible. I think we need to have a process but again, I think, you know, how many times are we going to inventory and inventory? It, it's like we're trying to inventory until we get the conclusion that one side agrees with. And then, okay, that's good now. Well, Governor, the, 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 the inventory process was done. The designation and release process was never done for Utah. My point is the process isn't done because uh, no legislation was, there, there hasn't been a statewide wilderness bill for the state of Utah. So it's hard to have certainty if you don't finish the process. Again, I won't defend the indefensible. We've come up and tried to bring people together for many years. Utah has been ground zero on this fight, unfortunately. We've brought a new temperament to the issue here. We've tried, in fact, to bring people together and say, let's go through the process as it currently is outlined. This was a shot out of left field, though. Uh, we have legislation. We created the Washington County Lands Bill, which I think was a good one that this body helped pass. Uh, I'd like to do that in every county in the state. Thank you, Governor. Chairman, how much time do I have left? You have 58 seconds. Okay, I'll, I'll keep this short. I, uh, Governor Otter used the phrase lands of no use. And um, as I close, I just want to make the point as a former uh, wilderness guide whose livelihood was tied to these very kinds of lands, in, including the Gila Wilderness, which was the, uh, literally the birthplace of wilderness in the American West, the, the very first wilderness uh, protected under an administrative rule before it was designated in 1964, that these are not lands of no uses. They, uh, they are lands where hunting and fishing is allowed. They're allow uh, lands where commercial guiding is allowed. And in states like Utah, New Mexico, and Idaho uh, generate enormous sums of income for people who have uh, very real uh, jobs and, and provide well for their families. So thank you both for testifying today. Thank you. The time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. Labrador, Idaho. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield my time to the good gentleman from Utah. Gentleman from uh, Utah, Mr. Bishop is recognized. It was the good gentleman, by the way. 
Oh, yeah, wait, do you want me to make that determination? <laughs> sure. and, and in the ecumenical spirit that we have here, I'm going to yield one minute to uh, Mr. Mr. Pierce first. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate uh, seeing you both here, and I, I would like to follow up. I guess uh, New Mexico guys are all going to ask about process. Last year, uh, the PILT funds were cut by about 15 percent uh, by the majority. Did anyone come out to you in the process and ask you what you felt about those decreases to your funds? <laughs> no. 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 Well, it's, uh, I just want to make that one, uh, one point about process, and I would yield the rest of my time back to the, to the gentleman. I, I do appreciate your efforts on talking about process because FLIPMA does demand that there be coordination. And the fact that there was no coordination with state and local governments, despite that's what is in the statute, is, is some, somewhat troubling here. And especially because, as you said, the, the so-called uh, Levitt-Norton agreement was a direct result of having the process gone through and then lawsuit after lawsuit over the process. So you know, there was a lot of talk that went with that. I do want to ask two specific questions, though, to each of you, actually the same question. And it deals, because I'm no school teacher, it deals with education. I want you just to very quickly tell me the significance of education, the, the difficulty you have in funding education, and then for the state of Utah, school trust lands and how difficult they are. And as well for Idaho, you have, uh, I think, school endowment lands, seven or eight different ki kinds or categories of those. And that once again, as we go through this process, if we create a new wildlands designation where we know don't know how long it will take to finalize that process of designation. I'm assuming that not all of that land is going to be federally owned. There will be sitla lands, there will be private property and holdings. What does that do to your efforts to try and fund education in your states? Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Bishop, you're absolutely right. Uh, at statehood, the state of Idaho was given section 16 and 36 out of every township. Uh, those lands, which ended up being about three, a little over three million acres, those lands were then required by Article 9, Section 8 of the Idaho Constitution to be managed for the long-term financial best interest of the, in, of the endowments. The major endowment is the public school children of Idaho. And roughly $32 million a year goes into the public school fund from our management, whether it's grazing, uh, and this also includes forest. Whenever we have an action such as this, and whenever we have a, a wildlands designation or some kind of a restriction uh, on those lands, those federal lands that surround our, those sections 16 and 36, it automatically restricts what we can do on those endowment lands. And so, therefore, we can't fulfill our constitutional responsibility for the school children uh, of the state of Idaho. You know, there seems to be, and this is part of the push on the wildlands, there seems to be some urgency that if we don't do this immediately and if we don't protect this immediately, uh, the outfitters and guides, uh, those people that want to enjoy wilderness and do that on a, a tourism or a for-profit basis, uh, that those are all those qualities are going to be immediately lost. Idaho became a state in 1890. We have been living and working and dying and raising families on those same lands that now you look at and say, look at these wonderful wilderness qualities. Do you think that we're going to run right out and ruin them immediately? Not for our school children and not for the future citizens of the state of Idaho. Butch, yes, obviously I think that because obviously wisdom is in Washington uh -huh. and you people out in the hinterlands can't handle it. That's why you're there and I'm here. <laughs> can, I ask, can I ask Gary for the same answer there? Boy, uh, Congressman Bishop, we don't see it quite the same way that you do. Uh, on either count, I guess. But, but uh, it, clearly, when you have a state that has less than 25% of our landmass that's privately owned property, it inhibits our ability to develop commercially. And where you have payments in lieu of taxes, as opposed to a property tax, which is like getting five cents on the dollar, it inhibits our ability to raise revenue to fund anything, particularly education. I have to be uniquely in a state that has a fast-growing student population. So I have gr a driving economic expense on the education side and limitations on what I can raise property tax-wise because so much of my uh, state is owned by the federal government. So it, is, it definitely is a problem. Uh, again, the uncertainty that's brought here, I, I can tell you we've had our own attorneys, who I think are pretty bright people, review all this wildlands designation and what does it mean. And we're confused even with the attorneys. Now, uh, maybe that's a common status for attorneys, 
but we're confused as far as what does it mean and what's the impact going to be on our ability to move forward. So it's not just the governor saying this, it, it's a lot of people in industry, in the legal field, and saying we're not certain what this is going to do going forward and certainly not helping us economically. Thank you, Governor. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Holt, or should I say Mr. Watson, whichever is appropriate. <laughs> uh, I, I, I thank the chairman and I, I thank the ranking member for the shout out in favor of uh, neutron based thinking, a uh, neuron, neuron based thinking as opposed to uh, uh, semiconductor based thinking. Um, there, there's been several questions asked that I, I, I wish I had time to pursue, uh, including uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, how we preserve the kinds of jobs that Mr. Heinrich was talking about, since the theme of today is jobs, uh, which uh, clearly are valuable and uh, large in number comparatively uh, uh, in, in your states. Uh, and secondly, I'd, if there were time, I'd want to pursue the question of, of why we're paying so much attention to uh, uh, other lands that might be drilled and dug when uh, there are so many more acres that have been locked up by companies paying good money for the rights to drill there that are unused, so many more of those than there are uh, that are being used. But what I wanted to get to is the more central question, which was Mr. Markey's first question, and, and I'm not sure I really heard your answer, is if you're unhappy with this process of, of designating wilderness areas and getting to wilderness areas, well, what process would you propose specifically? Let's hypothesize, and this might be a difficult hypothesis for you, that there would be further designation of wilderness areas. Uh, how, would, how would we get there if this process is so unacceptable? Let me start with you, Governor Herbert. Well, again, uh, I'll reiterate that I thought we had a process in place. Uh, and whether we've got to the end game yet or not, I guess, is debatable. But we've been working on this since in Utah since the early 90s. Uh, I guess I'm trying to see what is the added value of what's come up with this new wildlands designation. Uh, I don't think all we've done is confuse the, the process. So I, I agree we ought to have a process that brings us a, a conclusion and some certainty. Let's go through it. What does this do that adds to it? We've already had the ability to reevaluate. We have Flipman that gives us some guidance from 1976. We know that by definition, wilderness is roadless. We're in the process of going through our states, uh, and at least in my state, and finding out where there are areas that are roadless and where there is roads, which would, uh, by, again, by definition, help us identify where are the wilderness areas that we ought to set aside. Uh, I don't think people in Utah are anti-wilderness. We're just saying that how many times are we going to go through the process? Let's just do it once. Why do we add this extra uh, kind of wrench in the gears that causes us to have some concern? I mean, before Secretary Salazar's uh, uh, policy, uh, I mean, walk me through, please, how that the, the policy that existed before and the procedure that existed before could actually result in, in designation. Well, again, part of the problem we've had in the past is that we get proposals out there on the table. You gentlemen and ladies are the ones that, in fact, make the designation. You're the ones that have the responsibility to say this is, in fact, wilderness. So it, it, it's brought to you, but we have differing factions out there arguing back and forth. We come up with something that we think is probably a reasonable conclusion, then somebody files a lawsuit. We have litigation ad nauseum over year after year after year. So we in, in Utah have said, you know what, let's not come up with a number, whether it's 5.4 or 9.5. Let's just go county by county through it, bring it to this august body and say, declare this the Wilderness Lands Bill of Washington County or name any of the other 29 counties that I've got in my state, and you guys declare it. But that this process is, is working. But, but, Governor, this is after the wilderness character is already irrevocably lost. That's uh, the point. Why? That's lost. Uh, well, uh, Governor Otter, I'm sorry I've cut you off, and we have only a few seconds, but if you uh, would care uh, to try to answer that, I'd appreciate it. Well, uh, yeah. I'm sorry, too, uh, Rush. <laughs> it's good to yeah. see you again. Good to see you. Uh, what has been lost? 
Uh, last year, we created five, uh, two years ago, we created 517,000 acres of the canyon lands. Uh, that was not lost. People have, have lived in those canyons forever. Uh, people have recreated in those canyons forever. They lived and died and farmed in those canyons forever. And yet those qualities are all still there. I, 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 the process, as, Mr. as Governor Herbert has said, the process is what we were dependent on. We went through a, a values process when we did the roadless bill. I say a uh, roadless uh, agreement. I say again, Idaho is the only state in the union that now has a roadless agreement that was defended by Secretary Vilsack and the, the uh, Forest Service as uh, a, an adequate plan to protect those areas, as an, uh, the, the roadless areas. And so we've got, we were going through that process until December 23rd uh, when all of a sudden it was announced that uh, th maybe that process uh, wasn't going to work anymore. Well, my time has expired. I look forward to continuing the discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentlelady from South Dakota, Mrs. Nome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the governors for coming today, too, as well. And you basically just gave my speech, Governor Otter, because that's exactly what's been going on in South Dakota. You know, we um, last year in Congress, a bill was proposed that would make about 48,000 acres of the Buffalo Gap National Grassland near the Badlands in my home state into a wilderness area. It would have changed the designation from multiple use into a wilderness area, which essentially would change the entire a function of that area. And it was very concerning. During my meetings with all of the local stakeholders, the local officials, they were alarmed by this proposal because they recognized what it would do to economic development in there, how it would change the usage of that land. You know, and a lot of times the conversation would come up that this land was in pristine condition and that it needed to be protected by the federal government so that they could step in and continue to protect it for generations. And that was exactly the point that I brought up to them in many of these meetings. Is who do you think kept it in pristine condition all these years? It was the farmers and the ranchers and the people who are utilizing the land now. Why do we think the federal government can step in and protect it better than they have all of these years? So, you know, that is essentially the same argument that we have going on in South Dakota. I met with ranchers who have permits to graze their livestock out in those federal grasslands. They were concerned with this change in designation that could restrict or even end their use of federal land for livestock. And then also limit access by motorized vehicles for ranch management. So I guess the question that I have for you is specifically means that once one of these designations changes, uh, do you know of any decisions that can be appealed uh, to the Interior Board of Land Appeals? Or, or what exactly is the appeal process once a decision has been made? Can it be appealed to the federal courts? Or what are our options as people that are utilizing that land? Well, I, I think you want to go. Uh, I th thank you very much for that question and for that statement relative to the fact that we've been taking pretty good care of it. You know, I, I would just say, and it's too bad that uh, the congressman has already left, but uh, my outfitters and guides are going out of business. Uh, and they're going out of business because of another great interior plan called reintroduction of Canadian gray wolves. Uh, all of the elk and the other unglets, not all of them, but uh, a lot of them have been decimated. Uh, but I would say in, in answer, that's what we're doing here today. This is our first appeal for reason. This is our first appeal for following a process that, however very difficult, has been frustrated by all of a sudden a secretarial edict that says this is the way it's going to be, casting uncertainty into the capital markets, casting uncertainty into the land use of every county, all 44 counties in the state. Where do we go to surrender? And that's why I'm here today is to make a first appeal for Congress and for this committee to take back your rightful place under, under your duties under Article I of the Constitution that says Congress should be in charge of this. And, and let me just add to what uh, Governor Otter has said. Uh, really, it is the congressional responsibility. It's not wilderness unless you say it's wilderness. Nobody else can do that. The concern many have is that because of delay, and distraction that we, do, we this just takes a long time. It just see, seems to be eternal in nature, and that's why, particularly those in industry, are saying, you know, we'll go someplace else. We've got to get some resolution here. Uh, you know, our BLM right now is not giving issuing any permits uh, on our BLM land, so our, our energy folks are saying, hey, we're going to go someplace else. Uh, I believe that we need to have a consensus-based approach that's, that's uh, done with a locally-based bill. So we can't, uh, for in Utah, to have one uh, comprehensive ominous bill doesn't seem to be practical anymore. 
but we can take it and eat this elephant piecemeal, one county at a time or two counties at a time, and bring consensus. Rather than say we've got to start with a number and then work backwards, like I think there's going to be 10 million acres of wilderness in Utah. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Let's just take a county by county approach, bring consensus, have you guys pass it and bless it and say it is now wilderness. We'll total it up at the end of the day when this is all done. My 29 counties say, hey, it was 6 million acres of wilderness. Who knew? But that's the approach we ought to take. There is a process that works. All this is done to throw a monkey wrench into the gears and, and it's throwing us off our game. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the balance of my time to Mr. Labrador from Idaho. Mr. Labrador has 30 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question, and maybe you can educate me, because I'm I keep listening to the other side asking about, uh, the, it's almost like they believe it's mutually exclusive, that if you have uh, wilderness areas, that then you can't have, you know, if you have these oil designations, you can't have outfitters through those areas. Is that what happens? Do we close it off completely so outfitters can't go out there if all of a sudden there's oil exploration in those areas? Um, not at all. Uh, again, we have a lot of outdoor recreations occurring that's not on wilderness lands. And uh, uh, one of the challenges we face, uh, uh, have rather in, in some parts of our natural resource development is we don't fence, uh, uh, we have to fence around the, the drilling rigs to keep the animals from coming in, not to keep them out, or to keep them out rather than get in, uh, inside. So it, it's, uh, it, again, we have the ability to be environmentally sensitive and so uh, there's no reason why you can't have uh, hunting, fishing, exploring, hiking. At the same time, you've got some natural resource development going on, certainly in areas uh, that wouldn't have not visual acuity, but would be within some kind of reasonable distance. Uh, we can balance this and have an approach that makes everybody happy. It's those that have hidden agendas out there that say, well, I don't want any development, or I want it all outdoor recreation. No, there's got to be a balance here. Time of the gentleman has expired. The gentle lady from Hawaii, Mrs. Hanabuso. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Governors, thank you for being here. Thank you. And uh, as you can imagine, you're far away from where I'm from and what I'm accustomed to. I am, uh, if you could provide me with some background, uh, the governor from Idaho and the governor from Utah. What percentage of your lands are we talking about that you feel is uh, directly affected by order number 3310? Uh, either one. I, I can tell you that the BLM land in Utah is approximately 68, 69% of our land mass. So if we're gonna have to re-inventory that, then that's about the percentage. Both BLM and Forest Service is uh, 35 million acres in Idaho, which is right at 65% of our land mass. Now, when we talk about inventory, because we've had a similar issue in, in Hawaii. We, have, uh, we had originally what were called crown lands, and we've always had this issue about inventory. And part of, of course, the lands are mountains and areas that, you know, there's just no way you can come up with an inventory in terms of a meets and bounds or something like that. So I, I'm curious about, of the lands uh, that you were talking about, how many uh, do you feel are really the ones at issue? Uh, is, there a, is there like a priority of lands that are at issue? Or are, they, are you just saying that all of those lands are gonna be uh, in controversy here? Well, we have some wilderness, and we have some wilderness study areas that are just, again, become de facto wilderness because they, we just study, 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 and nothing ever happens. There's no reconciliation, no, uh, no end uh, to that study. So uh, again, I, that's why we've tried to, uh, tried to move in the direction of county by county. We'll just bring people together, we're studying it, and we'll bring environmental groups and industry and local uh, community together, and hopefully, come up with a bill that we'll have brought to you and we have consensus and you'll pass it, that'll set that aside now once and for all. So you're not opposed necessarily to an inventory, you just don't like the fact that it has to be done all at once? If, we, you're, doing we, it, if you're willing to do it county we by were, county. Yeah, I guess my point is we were doing it. We actually had, 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 had some momentum in getting it done and then all of a sudden this new thing comes up that causes again uncertainty, uh, confusion, and is gonna hurt us economically because of it. We, we, were, we were doing it and, and working, I thought, successfully in bringing people together. So how many of the lands that you, you felt that you were already doing, what percentage of that is, are we talking about? 
you know, there's proposals on the table for anywhere from, uh, you know, 3.3 million acres of uh, wilderness to, to 10 million acres of wilderness. And what the truth is, uh, I don't know that anybody knows. People just advocate from different points of view. And it doesn't matter what the reality is. Again, by definition, wilderness is roadless. We have a lot of roads throughout our rural parts of Utah on these BLM lands. And now part of the argument is, well, that's not a road. Oh, this is a road. Well, that's not a road. And so we're, we're going through some pilot programs to see if we can identify what are the roadless areas. And at least we know that has potential now to become wilderness. So we're, we're doing the inventory. Governor, how long will it take you to do, do it your way? I, I'm just curious. <laughs> we haven't been able to do ours, and that's the reason why when I hear inventory of public lands, I go, well, let's see how long. I mean, we've had it for since, you know, yeah, I'll t I'll tell a long you. time, and we yeah. still haven't done ours. But yeah. how, how long, doing it your way, oh, how well, long do you think it's going to take? Who, who knows? My crystal ball is as foggy as anybody's. I just know we've had this fight going on for a dozen years in Utah. I've been the governor of Utah for about two years. We've done more on wilderness uh, uh, designation and trying to resolve the public land issues in two years that I've been governor than the other 12 years combined. I understand that, Governor. I guess my, my thing is I want us to talk about the same thing. Inventorying seems to be the issue. I just want to get an idea of how long you think the inventory is going to take if we do it your way. Well, it took us two years to get through the Congress, our one county. Now, we think we've found a process that works, and so let's hope we can speed it up. And with your help, we can speed it up. Uh, again, you guys should be taking some interest here and in saying, let's get it done. Well, uh, let's not let it go out on ad nauseum. Uh, why there's been uh, a lack of, I guess, urgency and, and why we've allowed this fighting to go on for so many years, I'm uncertain. But uh, if we, I guess if we could do it in the next decade, I think we can at least clear up Utah's issue on wilderness. Ten years? Ten years. Ten years to do your... If, if I might respond to that as well and how that concerns Idaho. Uh, we started rare one roadless uh, studies in the 60s. Uh, we finally got our plan in in 2001. The time of the gentlelady has uh, expired. Thank you very much. The chair advised members that the vote is imminent any time, and I understand uh, uh, that prior both governors had to leave uh, about this time period. If I could ask their indulgence to stay at at least until you hear the two bells, that means we have to vote. And then we will go vote, come back, and uh, seat the second uh, panel. So if that's, if that's acceptable to both of you, I would appreciate that. The gentleman from uh, Tennessee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, governors, thank you very much for being here today. I've enjoyed this testimony very much, very helpful. Uh, Governor Herbert, uh, while I was not a member of Congress in the mid-1990s, uh, I recall that then President Clinton unilaterally declared a large area of southern Utah to be a national monument called the Grand Staircase Escalante under the Antiquities Act. I was recently told that the area in between the Grand Staircase and Escalante is called the Kapirowitz Plateau and contains over 50 billion tons of coal and significant oil and gas reserves. Wouldn't the current policy of the Secretary essentially be doing the same thing with his wildlands declaration, sir? Well, there are some similarities in the fact that uh, when President Clinton did the exercise his right under the Antiquities Act to declare that a national monument, we were not told about it. In fact, our congressional delegation the day before had asked him, because there had been rumors about it, including uh, the Democrat uh, from Utah at the time, and. Uh, they said no. So we were surprised and blindsided and disappointed because of that lack of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, honesty. And for us in Utah, again, there is a significant core of really good coal. It's, it's uh, some of North America's best coal. It's high BTU. It burns hot. It's low sulfur content. It burns clean for coal. And that's been taken off the table. And, and probably in hindsight, I'm not sure that's in America's best interest, nor Utah's. So the fact that this kind of came out of the blue is uh, similar, but I don't want to overstate the point because I think that was much more egregi egregious with the Grand Staircase Escalante than this issue is here. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentleman uh, yields back his tie, and the gentleman from California, Mr. Garamondi. 
well thank you very much mr chairman governors thank you very much for your testimony your participation here today it's extremely important that we hear from you and that we pay attention to these issues i happen to have been in the department of interior in the mid nineties as the deputy secretary and have some familiarity with some of these issues uh... particularly the uh... the history of the uh... wilderness act and the federal land management uh, act uh, what seems to me to be in this um, order that um, Secretary Salazar has put out is a continuation of the previous policies prior to uh, Secretary Norton's um, decision to not move forward at all with the um, uh, wilderness uh, study areas. Uh, and also in looking at the details of the way in which this particular order has been drafted, uh, it appears to me to be, one, consistent with the mandate of the law for the BLM to study, to make proposals, and also to involve the public in the process. Uh, it seems that, I, I don't know if they've done any of the things as a result of this, done any process as a result of this order. Are you aware of any activity uh, in your areas as a result of this new order coming in over the last, what, two and a half, almost three months now? I only know that in Idaho's case, uh, our local BLM uh, office was given 60 days to reply. Uh, whether or not they responded, they didn't ask any of my state agencies, my lands or, or uh, any of the state agencies uh, for any p input. It, it seems to me that the reply is probably having to do with the um, procedures that would be put in place, how, how they would proceed and they would I'm glad they just took 60 days to answer that question. Hopefully they did. That then establishes a set of procedures that would then lead to the um, designation of study areas. But apparently, uh, at least in your area, I don't know about Utah, uh, has any uh, action, has any new study area been determined as a result of this? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Well, in, in looking at the actual language of the, uh, of the order, there's a process in that language for involvement of the pu public after a study has been done of an area and making the determination that it has the wilderness characteristics. Um, and, and furthermore, there appears to be a way out here. Uh, you were talking about uh, gas lines across study areas. Uh, there's a very specific paragraph that deals with that potential that certain study areas may inhibit development in other areas, and there's a whole process to deal with that. Uh, I, I would assume that's also not been put in place since most of this is now less than three months or less than four months old. So I, I guess what I'm looking at here is that what the Secretary has done is to reestablish what existed prior to Secretary Norton's decision, which I would argue, from my experience, is contrary to the underlying laws, the two, the Federal Land Management Policy Act and the Wilderness Act. Uh, would you agree or disagree with my assessment of what this thing actually does, that is to reestablish the procedures that existed prior to Secretary Norton's? Well, let me give you my observation because I've asked a question point blank to the BLM. Does this overturn the Levitt-Norton agreement? And the answer the answer that's come back to me is no. Now, we have others out there that say, oh, this overturns Norton Levitt. So there's confusion in that regard, even amongst the agency itself. What does it do? Some are saying it's silent on the issue, and so we don't know. And the Levitt-Norton agreement, and what came out of that was a, a stipulation of setting aside $2.6 million and not, in fact, using it in order to settle a lawsuit. Putting this back on the table actually opens us up to more litigation and puts us back to square one we had back in, in the, the Levitt-Babbitt days into Levitt-Norton days. So this is a step backwards and not a step forward, and it doesn't get us back to where we were before, in my opinion. I, I think at least part I would agree with is it's, it's unclear how this uh, addresses the Levitt-Norton. The Levitt-Norton was specific to the state of Utah and, the, uh, and what took place in that state. However, it appears as though the Secretary Norton's order went way beyond New, uh, Utah and affected every other state and, and literally removed from the Department of Interior the opportunity for the department 
and i think it's well way beyond the bureau of land management i think it probably goes to other federal agencies also that may have land that may have responsibilities within the department of interior and affects other states whereas the lawsuit was specific to utah hence the new order reestablishing what existed without modifying the lawsuit as it applies to utah i think that's the way it'll work out time the gentleman has expired uh, a vote has just been called but we have a time for one uh, final round of questioning and then we will break uh, dismiss this uh, panel and thank you very much for coming and seat the second panel we'll break for approximately 45 minutes and come back for the second panel mr flores uh, you're recognized for five minutes Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Governors, thank you for joining us today. I'll try to keep this quick in, time, in light of the uh, uh, vote that's coming up. Uh, I'm from Texas. I've, I, like my friends from Louisiana on, on either side of me, I'm from a state that has been uh, unilaterally damaged by actions of the uh, Department of Interior. Uh, and I'm also glad that uh, Mr. Labrador asked his question about the uh, mutual exclusivity of oil and gas operations and recreation, because I think each of you uh, disabused uh, those people here inside the Beltway uh, from that notion because everybody that works in the real world outside the Beltway understands that they can coexist peacefully. Uh, my question is this, both of you raised the question of uncertainty and almost every American gets what's happened. The last few years of uncertainty have cost us seven million jobs in this country. Uh, and so we, we've got clear evidence as to what uncertainty does to the economy. Now you've got new uncertainty facing each of your states. Can you individually answer for me what, I know it hasn't been that long since this, this uh, new order came out, but can you tell me what the expected impact is uh, in real terms on jobs, your, the financial, finances of your states, and your ability uh, to continue to invest in education? Thank you. You want me to go? Uh, Let's go with Utah first. Okay, thank you. Uh, it's hard to predict. You know, my crystal ball is probably as foggy as anybody's. Uh, but clearly, and, you, and you'll hear later on from local government officials, that uh, it's, this happens in their backyard where 60% of their income is derived from oil and gas mining in their own backyards and their own valleys. And so uh, the fact that we're not getting permits anymore, you know, which is maybe even outside of this uh, wildlands uh, uh, secretarial order, is uh, clearly a, a concern for them. If, we're, if we can't go out there and develop the economic opportunities of our natural resources, it's gonna cause us to have loss of jobs. It's only loss of jobs, but in our state, it's loss of income tax. And that income tax in Utah is all uh, designated, earmarked for nothing but education. It doesn't go into cops on the streets, it doesn't go into building roads or buildings, it goes directly into our education. That's the way it's done in Utah. So this loss of jobs and the creation of income tax hurts my education significantly. Not only is there a major difference in the quality of the job and the return on the job between what we're talking about in the management uh, of uh, our resources uh, for multiple use and uh, the apparent uh, idea that we're gonna create a bunch of tourism jobs uh, as a, uh, with, within these same areas. I can tell you this, that there are more people in one day probably that play golf on the floating green in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, than visit the Frank Church Knoll River of Return in a year. And we make more money. So when you're matching tourism dollars, tell me how many people go buy a backpack and tell me how many people put in some, uh, some granola and go into the Frank Church River of No Return wilderness area and what that dollar is impact is on me as opposed to those that are that are tourists and and qualify for tourism dollar designation that play golf on the floating green but and I, it's only a par three let me just add to I, I mentioned this ear earlier that each natural gas that's a seven or eight hundred thousand dollar investment each time you drill one of those things and when you do 600 down in, in carbon county uh, you can figure that out and that ripples through the economy so it's a significant impact and i don't want to diminish the tourism and travel trade but my goodness when you spend a million bucks for an oil uh, well and you, and you do a thousand of those that's a lot of money uh, th thank you but the bottom line is the impact on each of your states is expected to be significant because the uncertainty that this order is is generating is that absolutely. correct absolutely okay. that's right and with all due respect to Mr. Heinrich, who's not here to defend himself, I can tell you from experience, a typical oil and gas employee makes about three times what the typical outfitter would. So thank you. I'll you back. 
I thank the gentleman, uh, and we will uh, end this uh, debate. Uh, not all members had an opportunity to uh, ask questions, I'm sure, and if uh, there are members that want to ask you, I'd ask you to respond uh, back, and the record will be uh, open for 10 days. So we will, we have uh, two votes or three votes coming. Uh, that would, we, so what we'll do, we'll dismiss this panel and we'll re reconvene at approximately 4.30 and uh, if, we, if we can have the second panel seated, then we can uh, proceed right away. And with that, the committee will stand in recess until approximately 4.30. Thank you.